Okay, so uh, I, I guess sort of coincidentally, I, I got to have the, the last speaking role, and maybe it's appropriate, although um, I, I don't think I can add much um, in terms of the depth of the presentations that have already come before, and it's been an amazing experience listening in on this, uh, on this session. Um, but uh, maybe this presentation will give a little sense of the cosmic scope in, in, in which the issues that we're grappling with are occurring. Um, thinking about the Anthropocene and our role in it. Uh, so I'll, I'll say a few things about my career thus far, uh, a few reflections about global change research in the Holocene, then what are the implications and future directions for global change research in the Anthropocene. So I, I came to Aspen, uh, I guess, uh, if you will, an adaptation practitioner. Um, I was a snowmaker here and kind of um, in a, basically a chance encounter, I was able to meet John. And I was looking back at my uh, emails uh, from that time the other day and, uh, and, and read that uh, he gave me the job the same day that I met him and then said he was going to Sweden for a month and that he talked to me later. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, to, I had to find some other mentors and, um, and so I started digging into our video archive and, and at this point I had a background in political science and economics and was interested in societal issues but had really absolutely no appreciation for global change, uh, for global change science, or for the kind of broader natural and physical sciences that I now have gained so much appreciation for. Um, but it was really uh, watching Steve's uh, lectures that, that kind of um, transformed my thinking about this. And, and I, I went back this week and watched um, some of these early talks that I, I watched about six years ago. And, and Steve stop, starts out this lecture talking about the need for a science that's credible but meaningful for humanity that if you don't have any information, it's hard to know how to apply your values in more than a random way. And this really got me thinking, uh, another idea of Steve's that, that was kind of transformational was this question, can, can democracy survive complexity? And for me at that time, it was not only interesting to think about how science can inform society on these global challenges, but also how thinking about the interface between science and policy um, was really needed to preserve some of these very important institutions we have, like democracy, for their own sake. And so um, I think that's kind of inspired my um, research direction since that time. Um, but kind of over the scope of uh, the last six years here at AGCI, um, you know, kind of in general, my understanding of Earth as a changing system with society as an increasingly important dimension and in turn with increasingly significant implications for society has grown enormously. And I'll actually credit two workshops that we had in 2009 for really kind of inspiring me to continue along this um, pathway. One was a workshop that, that Tom and Roger co-chaired on climate services, uh, bringing water resource managers together with, uh, with, uh, with climate scientists and hydrologists. And then a meeting that Tim and some others co-chaired on the global phosphorus cycle uh, which reminds me of an important point I think we should think about moving forward into the product generation phase of this meeting, that uh, global change um, involves uh, topics other than climate change. And climate change is a very important one, but there are these other enormous challenges kind of lying out there somewhat at the margins of the popular conversation like phosphorus uh, that I think we need to kind of uh, include in our thinking about frontiers. Uh, in terms of global research to date, I, I don't think I can really add much more than what's been said. Uh, but I think that um, you know, the, the, the enterprise of global change research has been amazing over the 20th century and helping us to understand a world under stationarity um, and also giving us a glimpse of what is going to happen when stationarity uh, uh, is dead or becomes, is, is dying. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, and, and another thing that I would add that has been very um, important for my uh, kind of career development is this idea of informing decisions as a research endeavor, not just an application of science, but as a very valuable and uh, kind of integral part of the global change research inter enterprise. And I think Richard Moss and others in this room are really to credit for maturing that, uh, that, that, that sub-discipline. Um, it's recognized in the USGCRP strategic plan. Um, and I think as we were talking about advocacy, it, it overlaps well with um, an idea that, that came out in a recent article by Bernoski about informative advocacy. And I'm sorry, this orange looked great when I was doing it on my screen, but not here. But informative advocacy is injecting the scientific realities into the many different categories of information 
that the decision makers must take into account when formulating policy. Um, this back and forth dialogue ultimately opens new doors for decision makers to formulate solutions to complex problems and new doors for scientists to understand how their science is societally relevant. So I think that's uh, kind of an entree into the Anthropocene. Um, I haven't heard that term used very frequently this week. I think it's still kind of in the early stages of people coming to grips with what it means. Uh, the, geolo the geology community is deliberating right now in terms of whether they're formally going to adopt this as a new geologic epoch, but I don't think it really matters too much what happens um, kind of formally. I think um, embedded in this notion is that this is an extraordinary moment in Earth and human history. Um, we as a species are, are deeply shaping all of the planetary systems at a global scale um, that are contributed to um, the healthy functioning of society and ecosystems. We're aware of these changes that are happening and we're consciously deliberating about what to do about it. So I think those three things make this just a fascinating moment to consider. I think another assumption about the Anthropocene is that we're, we're no longer really talking about restoring damaged systems back to a prior state and giving nature back the keys and walking away. We're really trying to think about how to move forward with a society that is advanced and thriving and large uh, and, uh, and, and kind of working in harmony with, with those systems, but still playing an active, I would say, a managerial role. And I, and I want to kind of um, caveat that idea of being a manager with the need for humility in terms of our lack of under, complete understanding of these systems. And so we need to be careful in terms of you know, what we assume we can accomplish as we, as we move forward into the Anthropocene. Uh, there are, these aren't necessarily the lines of evidence that uh, geologists are using, but I think kind of the typical things that are mentioned are increases in temperature, alterations to carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycles, uh, extinction rates, uh, appropriation of terrestrial and ocean ecosystems, environmental contamination. And I think these not only obviously have important implications for um, society, but I think it also, and, and, and the kind of state of the planet, but they also have very, um, kind of the evolving nature of these conditions have important implications for someone's career that is starting in research now. And hearkening back to Susan's idea of using, if you see something, say something, I thought about two different scenarios in which this could occur. One is if you're standing on a subway track and you see someone with a sus suspicious package walk into a train and the train departs and you're trying to think about whether or not to say something about that risk that you perceive, knowing that it won't necessarily affect you personally, um, but that it will affect uh, other people in a different time and space. And then compare that with a situation where you're on the subway train and someone walks in with a suspicious package and you're trying to think about how that will affect not only you, but those around you. Obviously, I think the, you know, the, the moral choice to make is to say something in both instances, but it really changes the situation in terms of how you internally process that. And I think that is going to have an effect on, on the careers of those that move forward in time out to uh, 2050 and beyond. Um, not only kind of the practical dimensions of what research is important, where it can be conducted, how it's funded, um, but also kind of the um, the psychological, psychological and other effects on the researchers themselves. And I, I don't think we know all the dimensions of how that will play out, but I think it will be important in the, um, in the years to come. Uh, so some implications, the, some research implications of doing research in the Anthropocene. Um, if we assume that kind of society will give researchers a message that we need to preserve a safe operating space for humanity and for ecosystems, this is going to set research on an ongoing iterative set of research activities at a whole range of spatial and temporal scales, not only to monitor our current status in relation to thresholds, but to also understand those thresholds better uh, and to evaluate how future conditions, not only in terms of how societal decisions are changing, but how the physical and natural response to those uh, societal actions are occurring, whether, um, you, you know, for instance, whether decarbonization is successful and the relative uh, climate sensitivity uh, moving forward into the 21st century. I think we also need to recognize the unknown unknowns. What, what new boundaries other than the kind of canonical planetary boundaries that were presented in this paper are out there that we don't know about or that we're not talking about yet? Uh, to kind of get my, uh, my sense of 
you know, like a distilled set of frontiers uh, in global change research. Um, these are ideas that uh, John and I have been talking about for quite some time. And, and in fact, he did come back after a month and for about the last six years, um, we've been engaging on these ideas and it's been a really tremendously rich conversation and has inspired me to move forward more formally into a research career. And, and as I think about that, um, I think that it kind of boils down to thinking about pathways of how to get from here to there, whatever there is sort of decided upon as an aspirational goal. I think our research can not only help state that vision of a future, but also really get into the details of how different conditions like energy supply, land use, uh, economic growth, population transition to get to that future state. I think uh, it's come up sometime, uh, several times this week, but understanding the motivations of how, um, what, what gets people motivated to, uh, to adopt a particular pathway and move forward. Um, I, would, I would make a comment about the worldviews looking at my own career where it was kind of a very serendipitous set of events that led me into the kind of interest and understanding uh, that, I, uh, that I currently adopt. And I think that not only does that mean that, that people do have some space for flexibility in their thinking, um, but that we also sort of need to recognize and be compassionate towards the fact that, that not everybody stumbles into John's office um, you know, when they're young and impressionable. And, um, <laughs> 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 and and so so yeah and so in in kind of the end uh, we're all on this planet together and and we're all sort of um, you know kind of uh, endowed with you know these uh, you know the power for independent thought and so we need to think about um, how we get all of those individual actors onto something that's uh, acceptable in terms of a pathway that 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 leads us to where um, we need to be and I, I don't want to define exactly what that is right now. Um, and then I think we also need to think about the implications of our managerial role in the Anthropocene, um, and, and particularly in the, uh, in the pathways we adopt to make certain transitions, like a, a transition towards decarbonization, uh, uh, which for instance may involve carbon capture and sequestration. That adds a whole new dimension to long-term management in the Anthropocene, where not only are we managing carbon above ground, but we're managing carbon below ground, and that'll take place over centennial to millennial scales. And so the implications factor, I think, is something yet to be uh, fully explored. Uh, a point just that um, all of these uh, uh, evolving Earth system challenges will take place um, in a context where uh, things like financial market regulation, healthcare, poverty, national security, um, capture the attention of policymakers, and we're going to have to figure out how to operate in that space more effectively. In terms of concluding thoughts, um, I, I just wrote down the three questions that John put up uh, on, the, on the board at the beginning of the week, and then added in orange, which is less than legible, um, uh, some kind of more specific research questions that I'm interested in getting into. But under the banner of how do individuals individually and collectively make decisions at different spatial and temporal scales. Um, one thing that I'm very interested in is how can robust interaction between scientists and those decision makers, whether they're individuals or organizations, be established more efficiently? Um, I think that time is going to be increasingly of the essence. So um, knowing that it takes a, a, a kind of a sustained interaction for those relationships to be successful, how do we develop those more effectively and efficiently? How can that robust interaction be sustained and how do we evaluate its success? Uh, under the, this banner of how to, what informs the partitioning of investment for adaptation and mitigation, um, how can science kind of make sense of this question while taking into account the societal values at the level that those investment decisions are being made? Um, so it's not just a kind of a, a crude optimization equation, but really kind of incorporating um, the different uh, values in different places that would inform that partitioning. And then what are the key gaps in understanding thresholds and uh, in social and natural systems? Um, at what pace and scale are critical actions and in what priority? When are those thresholds, when are we approaching those thresholds in natural and physical systems? When are we approaching them in social systems? How do we think about those in a way um, where the timing is appropriate and we, we don't get a mismatch where we go over a physical 
threshold because we're still waiting for a social, social, social tipping point or threshold to occur. And um, what additional planetary boundaries are out there that we're not yet cognizant of. And I think that kind of as a, as a parting note, I think that climate change is, is likely to be kind of a, a prelude to just a vast set of challenges that crop up uh, for society working to make the Anthropocene work. And I think that this is actually an opportunity to get it right or at least learn a lot so that this can make future challenges that we may not even be able to envision um, uh, 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 be resolved in a more effective, effective matter. Um, so with that, uh, I'll say thank you.